Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about healthcare topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Hello and welcome. Today's presentation, Chronic Pelvic Pain in Women, is presented by Health Specialists. Our first presenter is Dr. Jenny Tran. Dr. Tran is a board-certified obstetrician and gynecologist with Washington Township Medical Foundation. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Jenny Tran. Hi, thanks for tuning in. I'm Dr. Tran and we're talking about chronic pelvic pain. It's a subject that affects many women um, and not uh, uh, discussed often, mainly due to the discomfort of the topic. And as an OBGYN, sometimes it's a difficult topic to address, uh, mainly due to the complexity of the symptoms and treatments. So what is chronic pelvic pain? It's pain originating in the pelvic organs and the structures, typically lasting more than six months. Um, it's associated with some negative feelings and reactions, usually cognitive, behavioral, sexual, or even emotional consequences. Symptoms are usually suggestive in the lower urinary tract um, area, um, sexual organs, bowel, um, pelvic floor, myofascia or musculoskeletal, and the, and the gynecological dysfunction. Acute pelvic pain, uh, the, so chronic pelvic pain is different from acute pelvic pain. Acute pelvic pain you can think of as why, why most patients would come see us in OB, as OBGYN. It's mainly for something, a pain that arises from an inflammatory, infectious, or an, an, a traumatic injury. Uh, for an example, that uh, over time can resolve with treatment repair. Um, an example would be an ovarian cyst that grows and causes pain and ruptured, or even uterine fibroids that le led to patients to have uh, um, abnorm abnormal bleeding, dysfunctional pain, um, and that also may be the reason why she comes in to see us, um, but then leads to a, a chronic pelvic pain. But that's the difference in acute and chronic. Chronic pain is something that lasts for a long time. It's been going on for quite a while. So chronic pelvic pain um, is something that condition that can lead to chronic stress, mainly due to the physical and psychological consequences. Um, the prolonged activity restriction due to the pain uh, leads to physical deconditioning, and then the fear, anxiety, and anticipation of that pain, uh, wanting to prevent that pain from coming, leads to mood and social isolation. And in studies, some studies have shown that more, about 10% or more than 10% of the patient with the chronic pelvic pain has some sort of major depression. Um, the other thing about chronic pelvic pain that a lot of patients don't know is that in about 25% of of, uh, unless it's acute pelvic pain that we usually see for chronic pelvic pain, majority of that issue, uh, pain is coming from non gynecological causes, and only about 25% is really from re the female reproductive system. The other are maybe 60%. So how does it really, how does it start, and how does it continue? And the idea is that you have a pain stimuli that started off, and then this pain stimuli is feedback to the brain, and the brain is now sensing this pain sensation, and it continues. Um, and then a reaction to it, maybe a physical pain, a uh, emotional pain, and a um, a uh, so that the pain becomes uh, more in the mind of the patients a little bit more. So for an example, I, I always tell myself, like an example would be if I touch a burning stove, I may not see, the, I may feel pain and it comes back, the feedback is pain, but the pain may be lingering on for a longer time. And over time, I may be deconditioned, like I'm not gonna touch that stove for a while. So it's sort of that, that kind of pain that continues to stimuli and the, the, the uh, pain is continued to be responding to, to an obnoxious response, even though maybe it's nothing, maybe you, you know, touch the stove or look at the stove, maybe that reaction becomes even more. 
And the other factor in chronic pelvic pain is that it's multifactorial. It's different things that are leading into the pelvic pain. It's just not one thing. I always compare that to uh, like the train track. You don't just have an endpoint, one train track to the next and there's a stop. It's multiple train track that leads to that condition into one stop. Um, it could be started off with visceral causes. Visceral are abdominal cavity or pelvic organs like your uterus, your ovary, your cysts. Um, your, you know, uh, your uh, bladder, any of that, your just uh, uh, the uh, bowel system, and then the uh, the other component, the nerve and the muscle pain, and then the psychosocial um, factor in the depression, the anxiety, the anticipation um, that may come in with the pain, and that kind of lingers and make the pain worse. Um, so, there, what are some of the causes of uh, pel chronic pelvic pain um, that we are often deal with? Um, of course, as an OB-GYN, I see a lot of the gynecological cases, and it's thought that about 70% of chronic pelvic pain is really due to endometriosis. Um, the endometriosis itself is a difficult topic and a very ex extensive topic. It's, it deserves its own presentation, sometimes due to the extent of the disease and condition. Other causes may adenomyosis, similar to uh, endometriosis, where the lining is, instead of shedding and leaving the uterus into the, uh, outside, is now into the cavity and causing abdominal pain and discomfort and scar tissue. Adenomyosis is a condition that goes into the uterine lining, and some patient comes to see us for that. Uh, fibroids or even uh, anexoplatagy is usually ovarian cysts or a mass of some sort. Vulvar disease uh, we sometimes see due to uh, inflammatory process down in the vaginal area, um, even uterine prolapse in men menopausal women. Pelvic inflammatory disease is something that also can lead to an, an, an initial um, insult to the, uh, the pelvic area that can lead to pelvic pain. For instance, untreated inflammatory disease um, a chronic um, uh, chlamydial infection or gonorrhea infection that leads to some sort of tubal ovarian mass or, or uh, infection that can then lead to pelvic pain, pelvic adhesions to the uh, surgeries. Um, other causes could be urological, the, ur uh, the, the, the um, urinary system, and that is because not many patients realize that you know the area down in the pelvic area do include other organs, specifically the bladder that's sitting on top of the uterus, the intestinal that kind of travels everywhere, the nerve that's in the locate in the area. So interstitial cystitis is something that we also see in, as a, in the gynecological office, um, or pelvic pain, uh, painful bladder syndrome. Um, is recently, I think, in the last few months or even year, year, actually in the last few years, but more so in the last few months. Um, I have been seeing more and more patients in our office. I think because the diagnosis is now more known, but this condition is the painful bladder syndrome is something we see often associated with urinary symptoms. The patient comes in with a pelvic pain and also uh, urinary, um, urinary symptoms, and then um, that's where we start the workup on. The gastroenterology, the bowel system is in the area, and IBS is something that's higher on the list of if it's not, um, if it's not a GYN or a urologic. Other causes that sometimes we don't really think of, but really it, it does play a huge factor, and that's the musculoskeletal area. The my, some patients with fibromyalgia have a long-standing chronic pain. The, the pelvic pain may not be as bad, but the overall pain that she's been undergoing may have made this chronic pelvic pain even more. Pelvic floor t muscle tenderness. Some patients have, uh, for example, birth trauma um, that may cause and induce a, a, a reaction, a pain, we repaired, um, for instance, a laceration, and it's been she's repaired, she's healed, but the, the pelvic floor still feels the pain. There is some sensation nerve that may not be there back, and she still continues to have pain. But um, the other psychosocial so um, component, I think, has played such a huge factor in pelvic pain, chronic pelvic pain, and the lingering of the symptoms, um, a huge topic, and it's abuse, even, either emotional, physical abuse. And a lot of that is just longstanding, maybe PTSD that she may have. And again, the example would be childbirth or even sexual abuse that may kind of make that pain, the lingering pain. Again, maybe an initial in, uh, pain or comes from just an ovarian cyst rupture, but she may feel pain, and that pain has now triggered an emotional response to that pain and a lingering pain, maybe a PTSD in the past of some sort of condition. So um, there, uh, 
workup um, in terms of when a patient comes see us, um, I like to get a detailed, I like to know the person, I like to know her medical history, her surgical history, her GYN history, any um, her menstrual cycle, you know, when men are great, uh, when did she start her period, how are her pain associated with her period. Um, the history also not just includes the symptoms, but I, um, when a patient comes in, I love it that she would ha she has a uh, a, um, a written uh, uh, diary of I would call it a book or um, of symptoms that she's been going to. It kind of tells me the patient's been keeping track of this um, symptoms that she's been going, how long it's been going. I call it the how and what. How did the symptoms start? What it did? Uh, what happened? Or um, how long has it been going on? Um, so those are the kind of things I want to know when the patient comes in and get the workup treatments she has had. Has she had like has she taken Tylenol or Motrin? Has she taken uh, other pain medication? Has she had surgery? And the association of pelvic pain um, with other symptoms. Is there anything related to just menstrual cycle, back pain, hip pain, any other bladder pain, for instance? The physical exam component is um, where we do our part in examining the abdominal cavity and the pelvic uh, exam, speculum exam, to look into the vaginal area. And also part of that, we can sometimes do the, uh, the um, muscle uh, and skeletal uh, examination to see if there is radiation of pain to her back or to her hip. Um, one thing I do notice is a lot of older patient, for instance, who have chronic pelvic pain, sometimes it's really just musculoskeletal pain. I've had a patient that comes in, um, a few patients that's recently come in, where she has for sure know that thought it was just pelvic pain, really concerned about OVs, wanted workup. Turns out workup was negative, but the pain was a radiation of, uh, in either, both of the patients I've seen were just from hip pain and also from um, ligament um, inguinal hernia. So other workup we do is sometimes infectious workup, sexually transmitted infection, long-standing um, infection in the uterus we can obtain from the endometrial biopsy to rule out other causes, um, but um, uh, polyps or benign growth in the uterine lining, um, inf chronic inflammation we can sometimes uh, obtain as a workup from doing the biopsy. Imaging study, we do pelvic ultrasound, um, and I think that's our mainstay in the office is that we do a lot of ultrasound to kind of assess and take a quick look at the uterine, uh, the uterus and the ovaries and sort of like kind of rule the major things that will cause um, pelvic pain, which a lot of women come in and see us for, ovarian cysts or fibroids, for instance. Diagnostic laparoscopy is something we do to diagnose um, endometriosis and also um, it's something that we don't do often but we discuss with um, patients. Um, surveying other causes that are, uh, that may lead to the chronic pelvic pain she may have fought and hurt herself and then leads to this pelvic pain that seems to be related to her female part but not necessarily due to the gynecological part. Um, and then if we suspect other symptoms are associated with the pain, then for instance, the bladder, painful bladder syndrome, we send the referral patient to see a urologist. If it's IBS, we see some patient to a gastroenterologist. Um, an example, I had a patient that came to see me and she said, I have this pelvic pain, I'm going to see my GI doctor, but I really want to make sure it's my female part that's not, so I worked her up and she's been going through this pain for a whole year. Um, so in terms of pelvic, the pain she was having was truly almost like felt like it was really a female related organ uh, pain, thought it was her uh, uterus, fibroid and whatnot. Turns out it was nothing but more than, so she went to see a GI doctor and it was IBS. So these things we do want you see other, you know, we, if we suspect and see, um, uh, we suspect other condition, we do recommend you tell us associated symptoms so that we can refer to the right uh, uh, specialist. Mental health, in terms of mental health, it's, this is important. Um, uh, referral to, for some patients who have been going through a lot of long-term chronic pelvic pain. Sometimes the the emotional component the the um, has been playing to factor that lingers this pain long. Maybe the pelvic pain has been minimized in terms of treatment already, but she is now having that linger pain again, the PTSD or the feeling the emotional lingering. Sometimes seeing a psychiatrist to understand that her reaction is normal, but maybe now let's work on getting that reaction. Um, minimize a little bit and maybe that will improve her longstanding pelvic pain. 
So treatment options, chronic pelvic pain, as you can see, is multifactorial. It's just not one one step approach. It's multiple things. We have to look at the big pictures, work it up, and rule it out kind of condition. The other thing is the acknowledgement of the condition. Some patients just feel that they're not listened or heard. And having a patient um, come in um, just to tell us, hey, I do have pelvic pain, let's talk about it. Our visits are really short, but patients have to understand sometimes visit, you know, these uh, chronic pelvic pain, you've been going through a long term, this pain for a long time, and the condition's been going on effect to you. Some patients feel they're not listened to, but once you bring that topic up, and we keep bringing that topic up, maybe then we'll start working up more. But I always help patient be proactive and bring that topic up. Sometimes it doesn't just mean one visit, it could mean multiple visits to find the solution. Referral to see other specialists. Um, and pelvic floor um, therapy, which you'll hear about a little later, um, is also in the modality treatment. Sex therapy is more of like for patients who have pelvic pain that leads to um, this, uh, uh, pain with intercourse. And sometimes it's also just the surrounding issue. Maybe their partner is not understanding. Maybe they do need to see a couple counseling to, for the partner to understand that she is going through a pelvic pain and it's not just in her head, not because she doesn't want it to, it maybe because she does really have an underlying condition that needs to be looked at and be um, more sympathetic of. And also to help the partner understand that she is, to, to what she, they can do to help the patient um, you know, feel better and be more um, into doing, you know, wanting to do it more. Cognitive behavioral therapy is to kind of like the mind body is that if we could help you, if the patient can be able to learn to do relaxation, to do uh, treatment, to sort of like figure what triggers and what not triggers and and, and try to avoid that or try to um, um, uh, uh, approach that behavioral differently, then maybe her pain won't be as bad. The other treatment modalities are um, just, this is just an expansive list, but in just a brief overview, is like to talk about pain, we do some, sometimes chronic pelvic pain is, requires um, more than just us as GYN. We do see, we do prescribe Motrin or NSAIDs, we recommend Tylenol, but pain, maybe there are other pain medications or pain, um, treatments will require that you may need to see the pain specialist, so we refer patients to as a specialist. Uh, neuropathic medication, again, the antidepressants is a fact we do, uh, I often sometimes prescribe in office, mainly because the I see the social, uh, the um, psychological aspect of uh, depression and anxiety that may play a, play a huge factor in pelvic pain. Um, an example, perfect example, is recently a patient saw me. She has endometriosis and she has been treated, but she's been doing better with pain. But the anxiety and the the worrisome, and she's going through the hormonal changes in the perimenopausal phase. She was so anxious and depressed, um, and we worked it up. I mean, I talked to her and you know tried a little maybe a low dose antidepressant. For her, after uh, after follow-up, she has felt much better, felt more improved, her mood has changed, she has taken the pain differently, she feels better. Um, muscle relaxants um, are, is also something we also sometimes prescribe. Procedure treatments, trigger points injection, Botox injection for um, overactive bladder, for instance, ablation, which is a surgical procedure. Um, as a DO, I am very into the alternative treatments as well. I think exercise has this role in um, pain, musculoskeletal pain, yoga, exercise, tai chi, relaxation, massage. <laughs> Who doesn't deserve a massage? Um, and osteopathic. Um, um, manipulative techniques as a deal. I don't do them, but most, a lot of my colleagues do, and to treat the musculoskeletal pain associated with the chronic pelvic pain. I find a huge role in acupuncture. Some patients do well with just acupuncture um, in terms of other, um, with, uh, in conjunction with the medical treatment. Um, and then diagnostic lab, just one note on lab, diagnostic laparoscopy or operative laparoscopy, removing adhesions, has not been proven to use in studies uh, to, for treatment-wise. However, um, the going back to the topic of acknowledgement of the condition, some patients may have this pain. We may not see the pain. Um, you know, as a physician, I don't see the pain. Sometimes I know the pain, I hear about it. But the patient wants to know, does she really have endometriosis, for example? Does she have scar tissue that's causing that pain? And sometimes just finding out using, doing diagnostic laparoscopy, patient may feel better knowing that she has a condition, yes or no, and move on and move forward to the treatment. 
Um, that's all for my presentation. Um, I hope this was informative and I hope that this opened the discussion of you coming to see us and discuss and start talking about you know, pelvic pain and for us as a doctor to help you in um, getting more pain, better pain management or pain-free lifestyle. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tran. Our next presenter is Becca Bissett. Becca is a physical therapist with the Washington Outpatient Rehab Center. She specializes in pelvic rehabilitation. Please welcome Becca Bissett. Hello, my name is Becca Bissett and I'm a physical therapist at Washington Hospital in Fremont. And today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about pelvic pain and physical therapy. So what is pelvic pain? Dr. Tran did an excellent job talking to you about pelvic pain as an OBGYN. Um, a little bit more simplified, one in seven American women between the ages of 18 to 50 have pelvic pain. Pelvic pain is often defined as pain in the abdomen or the pelvis that has lasted longer than three months, whereas chronic pel pelvic pain being defined as lasting longer than six months. So the abdomen, the perineum, which is the um, space between the front of the pubic bone and the back of the tailbone, um, or tailbone pain being common locations or radiated locations for pelvic pain. Some causes. Um, so pelvic pain, whether recent or chronic, can be multifactorial, as we've heard. A thorough discussion and evaluation by your OBGYN is very important. Common musculoskeletal causes may include things like a mechanical fall on your tailbone, sacroiliac joint pain, or known as SI joint pain, childbirth injuries, pelvic infections or inflammation, postural dysfunction, chronic bowel or bladder holding or straining, as well as muscle guarding patterns. So some common complaints that we hear, generalized pelvic pain, difficulty with voiding, which is urination, such as pain with urination, hesitation, where you feel like you have difficulty with starting urination, or increased frequency, which is going to the bathroom all the time, 15, 20, 30 minutes. Um, difficulty with bowel movements, such as pain with bowel movements, or being unable to with constipation, as well as difficulty with intimacy and having pain with intimacy. Um, pain with sitting is also a uh, complaint of pelvic pain, um, whether that's a short period of sitting or a longer term period of sitting. So what is pelvic floor PT? You're gonna see on that right side a picture of the pelvic floor so you can appreciate that. Um, the pelvic floor PT is a specialty area focusing on evaluation evaluation and treatment of the musculoskeletal conditions within the abdomen and the pelvis, conditions involving the bladder or bowel control, sexual function, organ support, and postural stability. So that picture that we're looking at right now, you'll see at the very top of the um, side view of the individual is the diaphragm, which is a muscle that helps us with breathing, the transverse abdominus right below that, which is a muscle in our abdomen that helps with postural support of our abdominals, um, the multifidi on the back, which is a lumbar support um, muscle, as well as the pelvic floor as the sling of muscles on the bottom. You can appreciate those um, bony landmarks, including the pubic bone and the sacrum, and at the very base of that sacrum is our tailbone, and the pelvic floor goes from the front of the pubic bone all the way to the back. So that's the place that I'm talking about as far as the perineum. So we talked a little bit about the pelvic floor. Um, I commonly refer it as the hammock or the sling of muscles from our tailbone to our pubic bone. It assists with sexual function and postural stability, supports the bladder and female reproductive organs. So it keeps urine in your bladder, it reduces pelvic organ prolapse, and it provides support in pregnancy as well. So some real life pelvic floor dysfunction um, examples. I think my favorite question I was ever asked by someone was, do I have a pelvic floor? So chances are, if you have a pelvis, you have a pelvic floor. Um, and I use this quote a lot, just because these issues are common does not mean they're normal. So urinary leakage or pain with coughing, sneezing, lifting, or laughing. Increased frequency in urination, I talked about every 15, 20, or 30 minutes. Um, but even every hour is, is a little too often. Pain with sex or exercise in the pelvic or abdominal region, as well as increased pain or inability to tolerate a pelvic exam by an OBGYN. Difficulty or pain during urination or bowel movements is also a good indicator. 
So back to a side view um, of the body. So I like to talk about our core, our pelvic floor, and our breathing and how they all relate to each other. So in an evaluation, I like to look at um, how people are breathing, like that breathing muscle with the diaphragm. So I like to see how that's moving. I like to see how the abdominal wall is working and functioning, if it's strong, if you're able to um, relax it, as well as the lumbar and thoracic muscles and how they're working to help stabilize the pelvis and the, and the spine. So with inhalation, our pelvic floor reflexively relaxes and our abdominals also relax. So we take a deep breath in, our belly should expand and our pelvic floor should relax down. When we exhale, our pelvic floor should contract reflexively and our abdominals should contract reflexively. So relaxation, let's talk a little bit more about that. So in order to fully contract a muscle, we need to be able to fully relax the muscle. On the right side there, we're going to show a picture of um, a bicep. I always compare the pelvic floor to a bicep because it's, you always see the bicep, but you don't always see your pelvic floor. So when you extend your elbow, that's relaxing your bicep or stretching it. Um, and we need to be able to fully relax our muscles in order to best contract them. Really strong muscles are able to fully stretch in order to fully contract. So when you take an inhalation and you fill that belly, that's a diaphragmatic breath, can you feel any descent to your perineum? The perineum being that space between the front of the pubic bone and the base of the tailbone. Diaphragmatic breathing encourages relaxation to that pelvic floor. Contraction. So Kegels, these are very often overprescribed, but they are appropriate for some individuals. Um, if you experience any pain during or after performing these, stop. Tight muscles need to be stretched first and then strengthened. So people who have pelvic pain that is musculoskeletal in nature may have tightness versus weakness. As with any muscle, we want strength, which is a strong contraction. We want endurance, the ability to hold that contraction for five to 10 seconds, as well as coordination, like the ability to contract at the proper time, such as when you're coughing or sneezing so you don't have any leaks. Pelvic pain treatments. So from a musculoskeletal standpoint, I believe that the best outcomes are a result of individualized care. Utilizing information from your musculoskeletal evaluation to tailor a program to manage your pain. Personalized flexibility training, strengthening, coordination training, and body mechanics are commonly a part of treatments. I do include some modalities, including heat, ice, or a TENS unit. But I think that proper education and instruction on your pain, the anatomy, muscle retraining often is the most useful modality to most individuals in managing their chronic pelvic pain long term. Do I need a referral? In California, PT clinics can provide direct access for physical therapy. This is insurance dependent based on your specific diagnosis that you have um, discussed with your OBGYN. So yours may require a referral for pelvic floor PT. Referrals can come from a urogynecologist, a gynecologist, an oncologist, or a primary care physician. So that's why it's really important to work together with your um, GYN or provider in order to get a referral for your pelvic pain. What should you expect? Your first appointment will include a comprehensive exam tailored to your specific problem. This can include a full body movement screen, postural assessment, specific tests of the abdomen, the low back, the hip complex, and an examination of your pelvic floor muscles. Treatment is individualized, but it can include things like myofascial techniques, manual therapy techniques, abdominal and hip exercises, and much more. So that is all. Thank you. Great. We're going to start the question and answer session. The first question is for Becca. What kind of equipment do you use, and would I need to purchase any equipment or devices? So for me, for physical therapy, I tell everybody to just bring yourself to your initial evaluation and all of your treatments. Um, I, I don't typically have people purchase things unless they are um, having pain with pregnancy or postpartum and they may need things like supportive SI joint belts or belly bands. Um, but for the most part, you are welcome to just bring yourself and not worry about having to purchase any equipment before an evaluation. Okay, this question is for Dr. Tran. You talk about acute pelvic pain versus chronic pelvic pain. My pain comes and goes, and this has been going on for about a year. At what point should I consider rehab? 
I think rehab is a conjunction of the pain uh, modality treatment with pain for uh, acute and pelvic pain, uh, chronic pelvic pain. So, um, if treatments would um, if it's been going long standing for more than a year, it's time to see rehab. And, but you do want to see one of us uh, as a BGYN to assess uh, what we can do with the pain, and then see if physical therapy is appropriate or if rehab is appropriate. Thank you, Becca. How often? is rehab and how long should I go for? So everything for physical therapy is very individualized. I have some patients that I see um, once a week and I have some people that I see once every other week. So the answer really depends. Um, it depends on how much you need and how much, um, how much we can assist you in treatments as we're working together. Okay, this question is for Dr. Tran. Could uh, chronic pelvic pain affect my fertility? Um, yes and no. There, the, the underlying condition, chronic pelvic pain, for instance, if it's adhesions or endometriosis or pelvic inflammatory disease, that can affect uh, tubal or ovarian um, pathology. It can affect, affect the ovary and the tubes, and that may affect fertility. So yes, in a sense, that chronic pelvic pain can cause, it can lead to infertility or infertility can lead to chronic pelvic pain. The underlying condition can lead to chronic pelvic pain. Okay, and our last question for the evening. Um, how will rehab affect my fitness routine? And this is for Becca. So I get asked that all the time because I think a lot of people like to do a lot of exercise regardless of how much pain they're in. Um, whether you have a low back strain or pelvic pain, if your pain is increasing while doing exercises for your normal routine, you should definitely taper back work on the underlying cause of your pain, and then we can taper you back into that program. For the most part, I hate taking away exercise from people um, because I also like to exercise, so I understand that you want to continue with your exercise routine. So if it's not painful for you, I try not to take it away. I try to modify it or make it even harder sometimes. Okay, this concludes our program. Thank you, Dr. Tran. Thank you, Becca, for your expertise. And thank you to our viewers for tuning in. The entire broadcast of this evening's event will be available on our Facebook page and YouTube.